This is the OTB Television Network. Coming into the stretch, that's Jiper out in the middle of the track. Cyan along the rail with Rydan. Coming through the stretch now, that's Jiper and Rydan still battling for the lead. Military plume on the far outside coming on with Smart and Cyan. Now coming to the 16th pole, it's Jiper and Rydan still battling head and head. And as they go over the finish line, it's a photograph for the win. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Down the Stretch. I'm Mark Cassano on a beautiful Traverse Saturday here at Saratoga. And over the next hour, we will be bringing you five very special guests, all who have stakes runners going this afternoon, beginning in just a moment with Mr. Reed Baker, whose moonshine mullen will contest this afternoon's Travers. He will be followed, and this will be our local segment, he will be followed by Jack Wolf and Don Lucarelli, whose Hilda's passion will go for the grade one ballerina. Then Mr. Chad Brown, the local product, having a sensational meet. We'll talk about his meet and talk about Bowman's Causeway in this afternoon's Travers. And finally, from West Point Thoroughbreds, Mr. Terry Finley. They've got run flat out for this afternoon's King's Bishop. Along the way, we will look back at a trio of historic Travers from the past. So all of that and more if you stay with us for this, our August 27th edition of the program, which is being sponsored by Parting Glass Racing, and you can visit them on the web at partingglassracing.com, by Whitehall Stable, Jim Pippo and the folks at Whitehall Stable, whitehallstable.com, by Hibiscus Stables, and you can see them on the web at hibiscusstables.com, and by West Point Thoroughbreds. And again, later in the program, Terry Finley will join us. We hope you enjoyed this morning's open of the 1962 Travers with Jiper and Rydan, and again, three more historic Travers going to the internal breaks. First guest this morning, shipped in earlier at the meet and finished a bang up second in the Jim Dandy. The Colt is Moonshine Mullen, our first guest, his trainer, Mr. Reed Baker. Reed, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. Nice to see you. Mm -hmm. Tell our audience a little bit about Moonshine Mullen, if you would. Well, I got him last year, about May. He's a two-year-old. Came from Ocala and uh, trained him all summer and started running him in the summertime. And, you know, each experience was better. It wasn't one of those horses that flashed something early and then never showed anything again. So we're, we've always been on the upswing. I took him to Florida. I wanted to run him on the dirt. Couldn't do that whenever I put him in. There was a grass race coming, so the dirt race obviously didn't fill. And his two grass starts, he got bothered badly, got bumped badly. So they were kind of a toss. But I thought at the time, you know, I was hoping to get a good race into him and then go to the bluegrass because I knew he liked the poly. But I wish I had him because at the time, now we realize he's a better dirt horse than he is a poly or a glass, grass horse. You know, that, that's, that's interesting that you say that because I've, I've been asking this question. We're in a new era of racing, and I remember asking Graham Motion this question about Animal Kingdom earlier in the year, Tommy Albertrani about Brilliant Speed, and, and you just answered it to a degree. Why didn't Moonshine Mullen make his first dirt start until July 30th of his three-year-old year? You couldn't get a race to fill at Gulfstream? Well, it was just unfortunate. When I was ready... You know, everybody's looking to run on the grass all the time. And at the time, they had mile and eighth races. People don't see, I don't understand real the difference between a mile and sixteenth and a mile eight. It's not that much of a difference, but certainly the other trainers think there is. So the mile and eighth races typically didn't go. I see now they're going to have a different finish line at Gulfstream, right, so they right. can run a mile and sixteenth. Well, let's take a look at his dirt debut right here at Saratoga in the Jim Dandy. He is number one in here. Emma Jane Wilson is up. Reed, talk about this performance, if you would. Well, I think he run great. He breaks good and does everything right. But as we get down the backside, what you'll see is, I, I should not I should take that back. He didn't break perfect. Broke okay. He didn't break as good as he does in Toronto. The stalls are bigger here in the starting gate. Horses have a tendency to wiggle around in them where they can't wiggle around in Toronto. 
So he's fine here and everything's going to go. It goes good all the way. But when you see the winner get away down the backside, we can't go with him. We've got to hesitate slightly. And certainly I don't think we we're going to beat Stay Thirsty, but I think if we had had the run you see coming up, we would have been closer. Now the betters did not expect much of him in his dirt debut. He was sent away at 37 to 1. Realistically, what did you expect this day? Well, I could see three or four horses in there he could beat, so I expected this kind of a run. I didn't, you know, we, I train nearly 90% of the time on a dirt track that is just like Saratoga at Woodbine. We're lucky enough we have a one mile dirt training track. See the winner's going here, now he's starting to make his move on the outside. We've got to hesitate here. Emma's still riding the horse, but she's certainly not going to be able to make this run. As you see the winner starts to leave, we're going to have to push our way out here. Emma Jane Wilson rode and she will ride again this afternoon. What does she bring to the table for you? Why is she riding Moonshine Mullen? Well, she's very capable and this is a very important race for both of us. I want somebody that thinks this is a big deal and it is a big deal. I can't imagine a jack who wouldn't think this was a big deal. This well, is the Travers. A lot of big jocks, they ride the Pacific Classic this race, the Derby, they're, you know, they're just a matter of money to them at this point. What did she have to say to you after the race about the way Moonshine Mullen handled things? Ran super. Everything's great. Everything's on a positive, upbeat note. How's he trained since? Better than he did before, so I expect better things. But it's a better field. It is a better field. How yeah. about 10 furlongs? What's your feeling? No problem at all. You can see that on the TV. We weren't losing ground at all. You've, uh, when did you ship in? Monday. The van left Woodbine Monday morning. And you've been uh, staying with Jimmy Bond uh, in the barn? It's been super. Jimmy's been super, too, and it's a perfect place to be. Hopefully he and Tisway have had a little chat about uh, I hope how to handle things. Tisway told him how to get it done. <laughs> Realistically, be brutally realistic. What do you expect this afternoon from Moonshine Mullen? I expect him to be on the board. I expect him to run super. Everything's been positive. We have had nothing negative. Every time the rider gets on him, he says he's better than he was the last time he was here. So. I think, he'll be, I think he could move forward and he'd be a fitter horse because all his races prior to the Jim Dandy were on the poly or the turf. You don't get his fit on those surfaces. Um, now he's had this race going a mile and eighth over this surface. He's the fittest he's ever been in his life. Reed, that sounds wonderful. We want to thank you uh, once again uh, for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch and wish you all the best later this afternoon with Moonshine Mullen. And as a little thank you, we also would like to send you and your lovely wife to go to uh, Jacob and Anthony's American Grill. It's at 38 High Rock Avenue in downtown Saratoga. There's a shot of the exterior, and uh, we want you to enjoy lunch or dinner there on us. And again, thank you so much for having joined us this morning on Down the Stretch, and all the best with Moonshine Mullen this afternoon in the Travers. Thank you very much. Thanks for having Th me on. Thank Anytime. you, Reed Baker, ladies and gentlemen. And we are up to our first break on this morning's Travers Day edition of the program. Thank you so much for having joined us. Um, when I return, a couple of local fellas, uh, the Starlight Boys, Jack Wolf and Don Lucarelli, will join us. They've got Hilda's passion for this afternoon's ballerina as we go to this break. The year was 1978, and after that incredible Triple Crown campaign, by both Affirmed and Alidar. The Travers of that year was one of the most highly anticipated. So we're going to take a look at a piece of the 1978 Travers, which unfortunately left many of us with an empty feeling. We'll take a look at the 78 Travers going to the break, and I'll be back with Jack Wolf and Don Lucarelli right after these messages. Makes their way down the back stretch. Affirmed on the outside, puts a head in front, shake, 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 Ali Dar is along the rail and he's moving up along the rail and a half went at about the same, 48 seconds, the pace is still slow. Down the back stretch, Ali Dar will force the issue with Affirmed on the outside. It's affirmed holding the lead by a head. On the inside, Ali Dar has the rail and will challenge him from that position. Then it's a gap of two. Ali Dar suddenly has dropped back very suddenly and appears to be out of the race. Here's Nasty and Bold getting through. Ali Dar is back in stride once again. It is coming on again. On the turn, affirmed, and Ali Dar will make a run at him on the outside in second. Nasty and Bold in third, and the trailer is shake, shake, shake. 
Three quarters in one, 11 and three, and they're in the stretch. In the stretch, affirmed and Alidar on the outside. Affirmed on the inside, nasty and bold third down along the rail, but affirmed continues to maintain control of the pace. It's affirmed, and he has it by a length and a half. Alidar driving, can't catch him on the outside. Nasty and bold is there. This is the OTB Television Network. What's better than picking the winner? How about owning the winner? With Saratoga's original racing partnership, Parting Glass Racing, our partnerships are surprisingly affordable, offering minimum risk, maximum purchasing power, and the unparalleled expertise of a superior management team, a team of proven winners. Join Saratoga's original racing partnership. Call 877-RACE-WIN. That's 877-722-3946. Or visit PartingGlassRacing.com. At Saratoga, every time you turn around, you see another pretty horse. And Whitehall Stable sets the pace. Fresh from a stunning victory at Belmont, Tockett's image is set to put Whitehall Stable in the winner's circle again. Blending the talent of trainer Seth Benzel and Linda Rice, a Saratoga pace setter herself, Whitehall Stable is poised for a season of powerful racing. You can share the thrill of victory. Don't miss your chance to own a piece of racing history in the making. Become a thoroughbred partner today. Whitehall Stable. When I was a kid, my dad used to take me to the track pretty much every weekend. And I knew one day that someday we would own racehorses. With West Point Thoroughbred Partnerships, you can become an owner and compete at the highest levels immediately. There is no better feeling in the world than watching your horse cross the finish line first. And there can only be one winner. One winner. One winner. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks uh, once again to Reed Baker for having joined us, and uh, hope you enjoyed looking back at the 1978 Travers with Affirmed and Aladar. Next pair of guests, they are local gentlemen. They are the Starlight Partners from Saratoga Springs. Jack Wolf from Schenectady, Don Lucarelli. They will start Hilda's Passion later this afternoon in the Grade 1 Ballerina. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Mark. Nice Thank to see you, you both. Good morning. Yes. Uh, Jack, we'll start with you. You usually purchase almost all of your horses at sales, but Hilda's Passion came to you in a different manner. How'd you get her? Well, Clint Glasscox, one of our you know partners, he's a big sheep man, and Grant Williamson, a friend of his over at the Vinery, suggested us to take a look at the horse, and, and we did, and pursued, him, pursued her, and uh, ended up buying her. Donnie, that's been a nice purchase. She's won five stakes for you since you bought her last year. Yeah, she's brought us all a lot of joy. I mean, we really get into it, and that's what our partnership's all about is, you know, really enjoying those moments and getting to the big games. And uh, she's really delivered, other than one time in the Bed of Roses. Uh, she's really came across for everybody. Well, let's take a look at how she delivered one of those victories 
we are about to take a look at the vagrancy from June 4th. She will be number two in here as we take a look at the vagrancy. Jack, this was pretty easy. Yep. <laughs> she bobbled she a little bit at the break. She a little bit coming out of the break there, but, uh, you know, when she wins, she goes out in 22, 45, and keeps going. Hopefully she does it today. And she went six and a half this day in 14 and four, which under any circumstance is racehorse time. Right. Now, this was a grade two. Obviously, you guys were looking to get a grade one with her. That is very, very important. <clears throat> I've got to ask you, why didn't you go off this race to Calder for the Princess Rooney, which is, in my opinion, although Sassy Image was there, but you would be catching her at three quarters of a mile, it can be kind of a weak grade one. It seemed like the natural progression. Why didn't you go to the Princess Rooney? Well, I think if you look at the history of the Princess Rooney, the, the, the local horses seem to have an advantage. Uh, if you get an off track down there, we weren't crazy about taking a chance there. And we just thought giving her a breather and, and pointing for the ballerina made, made more sense. So we'll, we'll find out today if it's the right move. Did she come out of the vagrancy well? Yeah, I mean, she yeah. obviously she ran a hole in the wind. Right. So that was a that was a bit of a calculated risk that right. you took passing a grade one at three quarters. And when you passed on the Princess Rooney, you chose the bed of roses. And Donnie, we're about to take a look at the bed of roses. She is number six in here. On paper, let's face it, she laid over this field. She was 35 cents to the dollar, and she ran sixth, beating 12 and a quarter. What well, right, in God's name happened? Right here is basically, you can tell right here that she's not herself. Uh, she would have went on with it and took the lead and tried to open up a little bit. And uh, in the paddock before the race, Todd had said that the track was quite deep and uh, looked a little different and uh, it definitely affected her this day because uh, she's, I mean, whereas we think she can rate a little bit if she has to, right. but by design, that's not her style. So uh, when she wasn't on the lead, we knew, I, I know myself, I felt that we were in real trouble. Uh, she just didn't care for that track. And uh, hopefully today, the track superintendent has it you know, sort of fast, uh, like it has been for most of the meet. But the Saratoga track for the last couple of years has been deeper than the Saratoga yeah. tracks of the past. So how has she trained? And I know you don't want to watch this anymore. It's got to be painful, but the bridge jumpers don't yeah, want to watch. Oh, my <laughs> Lord. How has she trained since this race? How well, she gotten over this track? She's covered the track really well. All her breezes have been you know, very professional and well within herself. And uh, Javier has said that, uh, you know, he had tons of force in her, in her workouts. I don't want to knock our odds down at all, but uh, really she's uh, handled it. And, and last uh, summer, uh, she just loved it up here and she flourished. So we're just hopeful that, you know, come out and, come out and run and uh, they got to catch us and see now, how it goes. Earlier in the week, Stan Huff was a little bit on the fence about whether or not to run Tar Heel Mom. Maybe, unfortunately for you guys, he decided to run her. She's drawn outside of you with speed. Jack, how do you see that impacting the way Hilda's Passion runs this afternoon? Well, I think, uh, as Donnie just said, that her, her best style is to go out 22, 45, something like that. And uh, we've, we've hooked... Uh, Tar Heel before, and she's beaten us once, and we've beaten her once, so uh, I don't see us, and I probably don't see Stanley changing his style either, so it would probably set up for Sassy Image if we go out and do that. But she's coming into the race. Todd feels she's coming into the race as well as she can be doing? Yeah, I mean, she's flourished up here. You don't here. believe us? Like <laughs> no, no, no I, that better roses, you know, it drove you guys crazy, right. I'm yeah. sure, but I mean, Listen, they run it on dirt, they don't run it on paper, but after handicapping as many races as I have over the years, <laughs> she did lay over that field and she got B12, so that's obviously a concern. Right. So you would think something may be wrong with her, you know, uh, but she's come back and really 
done great in the mornings and uh, was a happy camper. And all you can do is really get them into the race happy and healthy. And if they're happy and healthy, best horse will win. Well, I want to take a moment to uh, let you know and, and, and thank these gentlemen. Um, the ballerina this afternoon means a lot, and, and it means a lot to me as well, because uh, I, I've, I've had a promotion on the radio for 24 years here in the area supporting Make-A-Wish uh, of Northeast New York, and these two gentlemen have been on board uh, for the last five or six years, and the better that they do, and Starlight does at Saratoga, the better the kids do. So we can't root in the press box, but I'll go up to the roof to watch the ballerina and root her home. So I just want to say thank you, as always, for, uh, for your support of Make-A-Wish. I appreciate it very much. It. It's a great and wish cause. you all the best yeah. this afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Hope she runs well. Hope she comes out of the race. Good seeing yeah. you both. Okay. Jack thank Wolf you. and Don Lucarelli, everyone. The Starlight Partners with Hilda's Passion in the ballerina. And we are up to our next break on this Travers Day edition of the show, and it's a beautiful Saturday morning here in Saratoga. When we return, local boy makes good. Maybe we should change that to local boy does great. Chad Brown will join us. He's got Bowman's Causeway for this afternoon's Travers. As we go to the break, we are going to take a look at 1982. Don Lucarelli went to Mont Pleasant High School in Schenectady, and it's difficult for me to say that because I went to crosstown rival Linton. Well, that was the year that the Triple Crown winners got together, Gato del Sol, Aloma's Ruler, and Conquistador Cielo. But a man from Mont Pleasant High School had a surprise for him. So we are going to take a look at a piece of the 1982 Travers as we go to the break, and we'll be back with Chad Brown right after these messages. Still a very, very fast pace. It's 46 and 2. Paloma's ruler on the outside continues to lead. And Conquista Dorciello is only inches behind as they approach the far turn. About four back is now La Jolie gaining on the rail, moving into third. And Gatto del Sol is back into fourth. Paloma's ruler on the outside. Conquista Dorciello. Cielo for place and show positions. What a tremendous finish! This is the OTB Television Network. When I was a kid, my dad used to take me to the track pretty much every weekend. And I knew one day that someday we would own racehorses. With West Point Thoroughbred Partnerships, you can become an owner and compete at the highest levels immediately. There is no better feeling in the world than watching your horse cross the finish line first. And there can only be one winner. One winner. One winner. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. The highest levels of the sport. Meet them and learn how their model works so you can get in the game. Attend an ownership overview held every Saturday morning during the meet at the Saratoga Clubhouse at 9 a.m.
Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks once again to Jack Wolf and Don Lucarelli for having joined us, and I hope you enjoyed looking back at the 82 Travers, where Runaway Groom, owned by Albert Coppola of Schenectady, New York, upset the big three. Next guest this morning is enjoying an absolutely sensational meet, and later this afternoon we'll have his first ever Travers starter with Bowman's Causeway, Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome in Mr. Chad Brown. Chad, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. I don't know what to say. Sensational, spectacular, better than 31% winners, and as stunningly as that, about 55% of all your horses running first or second. That's, that truly is amazing. <laughs> Well, we've been doing, a, uh, my whole staff's been doing an excellent job, and I have great clients I train for, and we're just trying to put the horses in the right spots. It's working so far. You certainly have put them in. The, when this meet began, you had certain expectations. Did you think it was going to be like this? I mean, you can never expect uh, a meet like this. We were hoping and planning, and uh, we set our goal to just do a little bit better than last year, and, and luckily yesterday we passed it, so uh, pressure's off. You are outstanding in so many categories with first-time starters, but what I have seen at this Saratoga meet is horses coming off freshenings and layoffs of different spacings have been running wonderfully. Let's talk about the key. What are some of the keys to have, having a horse ready to run off a layoff here at Saratoga? Well, it depends on each horse. I mean, I, I, I learned from the best guy ever doing it, in my opinion, Bobby Frankel. And when he would get horses ready off layoffs, he had a plan. And uh, he might pick a certain spot way off in the distance and work backwards from it. And pretty much every time I'm getting a horse off a layoff ready, that's what I do. I pick a spot far off in the distance and I work backwards and see if they can hit it. Boy, have you hit it <laughs> time and time again at this meet. Did it yesterday with a turf sprinter. Yeah. Hadn't raced since Gulfstream. Yeah, it depends on the horse. That's a turf sprinter, and it's a totally different race, so we plan a little bit differently for those. And if it's a route horse or a dirt horse, we, we might have a slightly different schedule. But luckily, Bobby left me the blueprints. Well, one of the milestones you reached at this meet was your first ever grade one stakes winner. We are going to go back and take a look at a piece of the Diana. Zagora is number four here. She is in mid-pack. Chad, talk about this filly. And talk about what it meant to you to win your first grade one. Well, she's been such a consistent horse training in the morning ever since we received her. I think now is when she's finally fully acclimated to training and racing over in America. And um, for her to, to win a, a grade one at Saratoga and for it to be my first grade one here at home, um, I wouldn't have had it any other way. It was, it, it was the best way to do it. She had been, to be perfectly honest, she had been a little bit unlucky not to have won before. She really, she really was unlucky. Um, I just think the day of the Diana, everything came together. She, she got the trip she needed. I thought the turf was perfect for her liking. And uh, like I said, she was, she was training in top form. Um, so we were pretty confident going in the race. Early in the year, I spoke to you via telephone when we had you on the show about this filly and you said to us she's gonna get better as she acclimates to American racing obviously it all came to a head right here it did and uh, that's another thing I, I learned from Bobby is especially with these European horses you have to be really patient and um, if they don't run to their European form the first time you run them over here you know don't panic uh, they just might need to work things out over here and and that's what we did. We, we always knew she was a good filly, and we just gave her the time she needed. And like you said, she was a little unlucky. You know, you, you, you came out and said, everything I know about training European horses, I learned from Bobby. In, in layman's terms, what are some of the specifics, you know, other than being patient, what are some of the specifics he taught you? Well, I can't open up the whole playbook. <laughs> but it, it really comes down to being patient. Um, you know, just putting them in your program, whether, you know, it's how we feed the horses, how we even gallop the horses, and, and uh, how we breeze the horses, and how we shoe the horses, and it, it's just, you know, you get a feel for them training over here. Some of them acclimate quicker than others, and I think that you really have to be paying attention with each individual horse to, to know when it's time to get them started. When he, when he received horses from Europe, you know, some of them made it to the races for him 
in three months. Some of them took seven months. And I really watched them, and it, it really depended on the horse. And um, sooner or later, they show you signals in the morning, hey, I want to run. And that's when you put them in. How did Zagora come out of the Diana? What are you pointing her for? Um, she came out of there great. We breezed her this morning on the Oklahoma track, and she's training very sharp. She'll probably run September 18th in Canada in a, in a race called the Canadian. It's a prep for the E.P. Taylor. If she runs well over that turf course, we'd probably come back for the E.P. Taylor, but we'll see how she does. Now, does that mean you're not thinking Philly and Mare turf at the end of the year? Or, or can you go from the E.P. Taylor to the Breeders' Cup? It's a little close. Um, we'll keep it on the table, the Breeders' Cup. We also have Stacey Lita in the barn. And right now, Stacey Lita would be our primary horse for the Philly and Mare turf if everything went well with her. Well, see, you know, you've been on the show long enough to know. You just lead me into my next segment, and that is you didn't wait very long to win your second grade one. We're about to take a look at a piece of the Beverly D with the aforementioned Stace Salita. She is number one in here, also for Mr. Schwartz, and I dream of these trips when I pick a horse on grass. You couldn't get a better trip under Ramon. Talk about this filly. I, I think she's a world-class filly. She really is. Beautiful trip, beautiful ride by Ramon, and um, she, what a nice horse to be around. And She's very, very classy. We breezed her this morning also on the turf course at Oklahoma. First breeze since this victory, and she couldn't have went any better. So if everything's good with her, we'll probably take her to the Flower Bowl at Belma. What did Ramon have to say to you after the race? He, he just said hey, he got a beautiful trip, and he says, you know, uh, I was just a passenger, which... Um, isn't entirely true, but he's he's very humble, uh, Ramon. But he he just he did give her a perfect ride. Now, because the Breeders' Cup is at Churchill Downs this year, the filly and mare turf is a mile and three eighths. She ran a mile and three eighths in the United Nations. Actually, the race was a mile and three eighths. <laughs> she ran about a mile and seven sixteenths. <laughs> and I'm a Joe Bravo fan, but he had her on a magical mystery tour of the Monmouth <laughs> Turf Course. Can she comfortably get eleven furlongs? I think she can. She'll run as far as you want as long as she has a horse to follow. I think once she makes the lead, she, tr she you know she'll try to let up a little bit, and you maybe have to stay after a little bit. If you watch her races over in Europe, she was the same way. So, as long as she's in cover and has horses to follow, I'm not really worried about the distance. All right, it is Travers Day, and you've got your first ever Travers starter in Bowman's Causeway. What's it mean to you as a local product? To have your first Travers starter. It's exciting. It's um, you know I, I always wanted to run in the Travers and win the Travers. I didn't think I'd have a Travers starter this soon, but you know the horse is doing well. I think he deserves a shot in the race. Now please correct me if I'm wrong. It, it appeared for a while as though you were a bit on the fence about running him. Would that be accurate? Yeah, it would. It, I have a lot of respect for the Travers. I, I know it's never an easy race. I can't remember one Travers that was a, a pushover or a, not an exciting close race. So I wanted to make sure that I belonged in the race. I don't want to just come over here just to run. And I wanted to see how he trained and how he came out of the Prince of Wales uh, race six weeks ago. And he just keeps getting better every week, this horse. And, you know, I think he'll get the distance. And it's the first time I'm getting to run the horse without having to ship him to run. I think that's a big key. Let's take a look at his last start. This is the Prince of Wales. He is number six. He's going to get beat a nose by Pender Harbor in here. Chad, talk about this effort. You know, I wasn't sure how he'd handle the dirt. He had some dirt form before I received him, but my first two starts with him were both on synthetic. So I was just taking a shot in this race, and down the backside, I was very happy how he was traveling on the dirt. I thought I had a big shot to win, you know, midway through the race. And um, he was a little unlucky. He, he didn't have anywhere to go at the quarter pole. He, he, he had to go around everybody. And I think that's what got him beat. But, you know, it was, it was a good ride. I, I don't think he had any other choice. He's just behind a wall of horses, uh, De Silva. And uh, it showed me that he can run on the dirt. He's probably even better on the dirt. Really? Yeah. Now, this is the Prince of Wales. And I'm not, you know, I'm not knocking the competition. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we don't have the Preakness, the Belmont, the Jim Dandy, and the Haskell winner in here. What gives you the feeling today that he's going to be able to be competitive with these horses? Well, the competition in the Prince of Wales was nowhere near uh, today, and, and we understand that. But the number that he ran coming out of the race, the numbers we use, isn't far off the horses that have been running in these races over here. So when I saw that, that's when I started to think Travers. And, you know, 
every race he's run for me, he's gotten a little faster on his numbers. And it's three weeks in between his starts. I have six weeks to work with, so I'm banking on him running a new career top again, and maybe that puts me in the mix. Have you thought about what it would be like to win the Travers? <laughs> now you've got your first Travers starter. I've thought about it a little bit. Um, it, it gets me excited thinking about you know the possibility that we could win the race, but you know I don't. I'm just going to focus on my horse, and if he runs his career race and that and he finishes fifth, then that's what happens. But I think he's sitting on a good race, so I'm excited to get him in the gate. Also on the Travers undercard, a um, wonderfully competitive grass race in the Ballston Spa, and you've got Desert Sage, who absolutely fought the rider in a uh, very slow-paced race uh, at Parks Racing, uh, the Penny. Uh, will she like, there'll be more speed in here this afternoon, will she like that? Will she be able to settle and make a run? Yeah, I like the fact there's more pace today and more horses in the race. She's another filly that really needs to be covered up and, and maybe come with one run. And Her first three starts for me in this country were fabulous, and she was covered up and, and made a big run in all three. Last time she was totally you know, out of her element down the backside, and I wasn't liking that at all. So we're not going to do that anymore. So the instructions to Jose Lescano this afternoon will be get her covered up and get her relaxed? Yeah. Exactly. So when he knows, and I'm, I'm giving him the mount back because he, he knew right away he was in trouble, and we have a plan for today, so hopefully she's good enough. Is she doing well? She's doing excellent. She's been breezing every week with Stace Salida, so, you know, can't get any better than that. She's that's been holding her own pretty really? well. Yes, she has. So that's pretty good company. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good company. So um, she's been holding her own very well, and, th and that gives me a lot of confidence going on today, but it's a solid field. It is. And she's going to have to come with her career race today, too. Well, um... All congratulations. This really has been a spectacular meet. And, and let's face it, the last couple of years you've had wonderful Saratoga meets, but I think you've taken it to another level this year. The horses are running so very well, and you and your staff should be, uh, should be congratulated. Thank you. You, know, you learn as you go in this game, and uh, I think every Saratoga meet we learn a little bit more about how to run here and how to prepare for the meet. So, so far we've been learning. And you've had a couple of uh, good teachers uh, to mm -hmm. learn from, and uh, and all of all of the lessons with Bobby Frankel are now paying off. Yes, they are. Yeah, so we'll just try to keep it going, and hopefully, we gave you a couple winners during the meet. You've also beaten me with <laughs> some of these horses coming off layoffs. Just nail me on the wire, but I'll tell you what, it's just been a spectacular meet. Congratulations! Thank you for joining us this morning on Down the Stretch, as always. And we want to thank you by sending you, take your lovely wife and daughter oh, thank you. to Jacob and Anthony's American Grill, 38 High Rock Avenue, downtown Saratoga. Take them for lunch or dinner and enjoy it on us. Thank you very much. And uh, we have had a thrill watching your career unfold, and congratulations. Thank it's, you. It's been great, and good luck this afternoon with Bowman's Causeway and the Travers. Thanks. Thanks for having me on today. Chad Brown, ladies and gentlemen, we are up to our final break on this Travers Day edition of the program. When I return, Mr. Terry Finley from West Point Thoroughbreds. They've got run flat out in a highly contentious Kings Bishop later this afternoon. As we go to the final break, the year was 1994. Could Holy Bull get a mile and a quarter? So we'll take a look at a piece of the 94 Travers, and then I'll be back with Terry Finley right after these messages. Making their way into the back stretch, and it was a hard opening half mile here of 46 and 1, and the Bull's in front now. Holy Bull in front now by a half length. Comanche Trail, his work done now. He begins the feet a bit in second. Then it's a break of five lengths to unaccounted for. Tabasco Cat has now dropped seven lengths from the lead. Holy Bull opens up as they pass the half mile pole. It is Holy Bull who runs an eye opening three quarters in one, ten, and three, and he rounds the far turn with a four length lead unaccounted for has now moved into second tabasco cat is still seven lengths from the lead and concern begins to hit his best stride he has 10 lengths to make up and mike smith lets the bull roll he's in front by five as they come to the quarter pole but there is cause for concern concern comes on second on the outside tabasco cat is well behind in third they're coming down to the final furlong mike smith asking Holy Bull for everything he has. Concern is coming hard under Jerry Belly. It's still Holy Bull desperately trying to hold. Concern of final thrust, but it is Holy Bull as game as a racehorse can be coming down to the wire. Holy Bull wins! What a hero! Concern came to him at the end, and it was 15.
Team Lakes back to a Belmont Stakes winner. This is the OTB Network. At Saratoga, every time you turn around, you see another pretty horse. And Whitehall Stable sets the pace. Fresh from a stunning victory at Belmont, Tockett's image is set to put Whitehall Stable in the winner's circle again. Blending the talent of trainer Seth Benzel and Linda Rice, a Saratoga pace setter herself, Whitehall Stable is poised for a season of powerful racing. You can share the thrill of victory. Don't miss your chance to own a piece of racing history in the making. Become a thoroughbred partner today. Whitehall Stable. What's better than picking the winner? How about owning the winner? With Saratoga's original racing partnership, Parting Glass Racing, our partnerships are surprisingly affordable, offering minimum risk, maximum purchasing power, and the unparalleled expertise of a superior management team, a team of proven winners. Join Saratoga's original racing partnership. Call 877-RACE-WIN. That's 877-722-3946. Or visit partingglassracing.com. This portion of the program brought to you by Capital Bets. For more information, go to CapitalOTB.com. Catch the excitement with Capital OTB Online. It's now easier than ever with internet wagering at CapitalOTB.com. Wager online and get track odds, online contests, membership specials, and it's secure and fan-friendly. Whether it's a big stakes day like the Kentucky Derby, Belmont Stakes, Traverse Stakes, Breeders' Cup, or just a great day of racing, wagering online at CapitalOTB.com is always simple and easy. Sign up today at CapitalOTB.com because your chances are better with Capital OTB. Welcome back to Down the Stretch, everyone. I'm Mark Asano. My thanks once again to Chad Brown for having joined us, and I hope you enjoyed looking back at 1994 and Holy Bull holding off concern. Final guest this morning is the founder and president of West Point Thoroughbreds, who will run, run flat out in this afternoon's King's Bishop. We welcome in Mr. Terry Finley. Terry, welcome back to the show. It's really great to be here. Thank you. Um, good meet for West Point, trio of winners. Yeah, we, we've uh, we've been third or we've been second uh, three times. We have uh, three wins, so I think it'll be. Uh, I think when we end up, I'm hoping we'll we'll have five or six. I think we run about ten or eleven between now and the end of uh, end of the meet. Well, you run a big one later this afternoon. We'll talk about him in just a few moments, but I want to show a piece of last Sunday's Long Acres Mile because West Point had awesome gem. And if he's not a throwback, we don't have a throwback. Here he is, 
He is number 12, and despite a wide trip, he's going to get up to win the Long Acres Mile. Tell our audience about Awesome Jim. Well, we've had a good run. He's eight years old. We bought him <laughs> as a two-year-old. Uh, we didn't get him to the races until at the end of the Del Mar meet as a three-year-old. I'm trying to calculate in my mind. Uh, what year was that? Like, <laughs> like 2006, probably. Um, and he's been great. I mean, Craig DeLassie and his team. Every, you know, we always talk about when they win, you, you congratulate the owner and, or the trainer and their team. But they've done a great job, and I agree. I mean, he is a throwback, and I wish... Our game would be a lot better if we could buy horses with like the vision and a real good feeling that we're going to get 48 starts out of them. And I would, I'd like to think that we're going to get more than 48 because he's still got. I think he's doing better now than he's how about, ever done. So how about that? Exciting. And, and this may be the quintessential example. And in this case, it's Craig Delasse. When you spot your horses properly, he's won almost 2.7 million dollars i didn't really is it 2.7 i think it's 2.68 I, I know what it is it's about 2. wait a minute you're the boss you're, you're supposed to know all this stuff <laughs> no it's a good figure and you know what he uh you're right i mean you over the years you you would think that uh you'd like to think that you build up your institutional knowledge you get a little smarter and you you know you do a little bit better a, a job uh, picking spots and you know craig and the team have, have done a great job and the partners are there every time so it's really been a fun ride. I don't know where we're going to go, but we'd like to get back to the Breeders' Cup uh, at Churchill, and that'll be the fifth straight year for him to run in the Breeders' Cup. That's amazing. Well, talk about picking your spots. You have shipped run flat out clear across the country for not a real easy spot in this afternoon's King's Bishop. Talk about that. Well, it's a it's a tough spot. You know, we you know, the one thing is you really don't have a sprint stake for three year olds out on the West Coast. Yeah. So, if you have a horse that's you know at that echelon and and you think he's got a shot to compete against his peers, right, going short, uh, you got to come here to Kings Bishop. And it's a it's a stallion race, and it's it's a race with you know the history of it uh, through the years. You see some really really good stallions come out of it. So. I know it's a tough spot, and we're coming in as good as we can come, and uh, we won't have any excuses today. Well, we are going to go back, and you've got to go back a while. I want to show you his last sprint, and this was back on May 15th in the Las Barrera at today's seven furlong distance, and he is number one. As we take a look at the Las Barrera, um, Terry, he appears, and has always appeared to me, to be a better sprinter than a route horse, but he's been racing in routes on the West Coast. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, we brought him back. I, I, obviously, in his second start, we sent him two turns, and he didn't run very well. He got in a speed duel, and yeah. he stopped to a walk. So we, we backed up. We took a deep breath. We gave him uh, about 60 days, and he came back in this spot going seven-eighths of a mile. Um, obviously, he ran well, and we thought we'd give him a shot going a mile and a 16th, and he ran well enough, got beat a length to coil, that we kind of got – got sucked into going what nine furlongs yeah. in the swaps which you know turns out he didn't run very well and he was a, a mediocre fourth and we're cutting back so you you know he's kind of been in in a position where you know you we couldn't rule out going two turns and they're the kind of races that you you look back and you you know you're kind of ah you know it just didn't work out so but i think he's a he's a seven eight horse if you see here he's you know he he got the lead, then he, right, the horse came and passed him, and he fought back, and he, he really, he lost the head, Bob. But um, as I say, I, you know, we're in good shape today. I know it's a very tough field. Uh, Uncle Mo, the champ, and everybody's, uh, everybody's gunning for the champ. And right from what I, I hear, everybody's coming with their A game. So, like, the horse that wins today, right, there'll be no excuses why you didn't beat that horse because everybody says, right, from what I read and what I hear, that everybody's at the top of the game. And that's what you want, and that's where you like to be on Travers Day. That's right. How do you ship in? How's he acclimated? Uh, so far, so good. You know, he's a big, he's a big, strong horse, and he's uh, over in Oklahoma, and he's, you know, he trained on the main track a couple days. So, uh, you know, we, we can't wait to see him in the paddock. And if you're an owner, you know, this is where you want to be. You want, on Travers Day, you want to be either in the Travers or the King's Bishop. So on behalf of the partners, we're, we're very excited. When did you create West Point Thoroughbreds? How long has it been around? Um, actually, today 
right? 20 years ago today, we won our first race at Philadelphia Park. Oh my goodness. So it's pretty good. And I, I thought about that. That's a pretty good omen. So it would be, it'd be very nice to be standing in the winner's circle at Saratoga for a grade one, uh, right, 20 years to the day after we won the race. Wow. Um, let's put the West Point web page up there. Terry, for members of our audience who are interested in getting involved in West Point, how do they do that? How can they contact you? Well, they go to our website, and we, we, we believe that we have a pretty good website. We stack up fairly well, and it's very interactive. And, you know, we're, we're, we know that our website, everything in the world, you know, is really, for the most part, gone onto the web and uh, uh, digital. So we've tried to keep up with the time. So I think if you compare our website to a lot of other, others in the industry, you know, you're, we, we think we have a lot to offer. And ownership is great for right, the right person, uh, and we feel we're biased, but we feel... You know, partnerships are a great way to get into the business. So we welcome anybody that, uh, you know, uh, that really uh, aspires to be an owner to contact us and other people. There are a lot of good companies that, that do what we do, and um, we like competition. I've talked about that, but, you know, competition really keeps us sharp. You know, if you could find me another awesome gem, I might get...